Good evening, guys, and welcome back to the Highbound Convivium for September 27th, 2019. And uh, before you start throwing stones, I know that uh, I did not record a Bible podcast episode on Monday. I was feeling really under the weather Monday, and uh, I had a bunch of stuff I had to get done on Monday, so I just uh, pushed it off to the next day, and uh, the next thing you know, it never got recorded. Funny how that happens, uh, but uh, I promise... There will be an episode in the works, and it will get released on Monday, and uh, maybe I'll try to make it extra long or something, uh, you know, something to spice it up, uh, you know, give you guys a little bit of consolation for the wait. Uh, right now, we're going to dive right into uh, part two of J.R.R. Tolkien's translation of Sir Gawain and the Great Knight. Sorry, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, I hope you guys have been enjoying this. I've been enjoying reading it. Uh, it's uh, if you haven't gathered by now, it's one of the more difficult poems uh, from the Middle English period to read, uh, just because it's written in that um, alliterative long verse. Um, or sorry, it's it's written. It's not written in verse, but it's written in alliterative long lines uh, with the the bob and wheel stanza at the end and so uh, <laughs> you'll notice that at the end of every stanza I seem really confident in what I'm saying and then other times not so much it's because at the end of every stanza there's actually a, a poetic turn there um, but I'm enjoying it it's one of my favorite poems frankly uh, from the Middle English period and I think it's just one of the best poems of um, knightly chivalry that was that was ever done really um, and it really, to me, hammers home the the Christian and specifically the Catholic character of the the chivalric characters like Sir Gawain. That are you know Sir Gawain is famed for his piety, and so uh, you know it's interesting, and as you, especially as you'll see as we get further into the poem, how Sir Gawain is able to thread the needle. You know, and uh, and sort of be that exemplar of Christian virtue, uh, but at the same time, of course, as we all know, there is there's going to be a, a little bit of a um, there's going to be a bit of a ribbing at the end, right? Where uh, you know, but it's all good natured, and that's that's really what I like about the poem. Actually, is that it's very good natured, it's very wholesome, and it gives you a sense of uh, there's really a sense of hominess to it. Uh, you know, there's there's that Danish word that you know mean translates to something like cozy, uh, coziness or something like that. And so that's sort of you know what I think these Middle English and Anglo-Saxon poets sometimes are really good at doing. But yeah, I I, I think that's one of the the better features of the play. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoy. This is part two of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, translated by J.R.R. Tolkien, Part 2. With this earnest of high deeds, thus Arthur began, the young year for brave vows he yearned to hear made. Though such words were wanting when they went to table, now of fell work to full grasp filled with their hands, Gawain was gay as he began those games in the hall. But if the end be unhappy, hold it no wonder. For though men may be merry of mood when they have mightily drunk, a year slips by swiftly, never the same returning. The outset to the ending is equal, but seldom. And so this Yule passed over, and the year after, and severally the seasons ensued in their turn. After Christmas there came the crabbed Lenten, that the fish tries in the flesh, and with the food more meager. But then the weather in the world makes war on the winter, Cold creeps into the earth, clouds are uplifted, shining rain is shed in showers that all warm fall on the fair turf, flowers there open, of grounds and of groves, green is the raiment, birds are busy a-building, and bravely are singing, for sweetness of the soft summer that will soon be on the way, and blossoms burgeon and blow, in hedgerows bright and gay, then glorious musics go, through the, through the woods in proud array." 
After the season of summer with its soft breezes, when Zephyrus goes sighing through the seeds and herbs, right glad is the grass that grows in the open when the damp dewdrops are dripping from the leaves to greet a gay glance of the glistening sun. But then harvest hurries in and hardens it quickly, warns it before the winter to wax to ripeness. He drives with his drought the dust till it rises from the face of the land and flies up aloft. Wild wind in the welkin makes war on the sun, that leaves loosed from the linden alight on the ground, and all gray is the grass that green was before. All things ripen and rot that rose up at first, so the year runs away in yesterday's many, and here winter wins again, as by the way of the world it ought, until Michaelmas moon has winter's boating brought, Sir Gawain then full soon of his grievous journey thought. And yet till all hallows with Arthur he lingered, who furnished on that festival a feast for the night, with much royal revelry of the round table. The knights of renown and noble ladies, all for the love of that lord, had longing at heart, but nevertheless the more lightly of laughter they spoke. Many were joyless who jested for his gentle sake, for after their meal mournfully he reminded his uncle that his departure was near, and plainly he said, Now, liege lord, of my life, for leave I beg you. You know this quest in the compact, I care not further to trouble you with tale of it, save a trifling point. I must set forth to my fate without fail in the morning, as God will guide me, the green man to seek. Those most accounted in the castle came then together, Iwain and Eric, and others not a few, Sir Donadal le Sauvage, the Duke of Clarence, Lancelot, and Lionel, and Lucan the Good, Sir Bors and Sir Bedivere, that were both men of might, and many others of the mark with Mador de la Porte. All this company of the court the king now approached, to comfort the knight with the care of their hearts. Much mournful lament was made in the hall, that one so worthy as Gawain could wend on that errand, to endure a deadly dent and deal no more with blade, the knight ever made good cheer, saying, Why should I be dismayed? Of doom, the fairer or drear, by a man, must be assayed. He remained there that day, and in the morning got ready, asked early for his arms, and they were all brought him. First a carpet of red silk was arrayed on the floor, and the gilded gear in plenty there glittered upon it. The stern man stepped thereon, and the steel things handled, dressed in a doublet of damask of Tharsia, and over it a cunning cabadoce that was closed at the throat, with fair ermine was furred all within, then sabatons first set on his feet his legs lapped in steel and his lordly greaves, on which the polains they placed, polished and shining, and knit upon his knees with knots of all gold, and then the comely cuses that cunningly clasped the thick thews of his thighs, they with thongs on him tied, and next the birney, woven of bright steel rings upon costly quilting, enclosed him about, and armlets well burnished upon both of his arms, with gay elbow pieces and gloves of plate, and all the goodly gear that guard him whatever betide, coat armor richly made, gold spurs on heel and pride, girt with a trusty blade, silk belt about his side. When he was hasped in his armor, his harness was splendid. The least latchet or loop was all lit with gold. Thus harnessed as he was, he heard now his mass that was offered and honored at the high altar. And then he came to the king and his court companions, and with love he took leave of lords and ladies. And they kissed him and escorted him, and to Christ commended him. And now Gringolet stood groomed and girt with a saddle, gleaming rightly gaily with many gold fringes, and all newly for the knots, nailed at all points, adorned with bar was the bridle, with bright gold banded, that apparelling proud of portrait and skirts, and the crupper and caparison corded with the saddle bows. All was arrayed in red and rich gold studded, so that it glittered and glinted as a gleam of the sun. Then he in hand took the helm, and in haste kissed it. Strongly was it stapled and stuffed within. It sat high upon his head, and was hasped at the back, and a light kerchief was laid over the beaver, all braided and bound with the brightest gems, upon broad silk embroidery, with birds on the seams like popinjays depainted, here preening and there, turtles and true loves entwined as thickly, as if many sempstresses had sewing full seven winters in hand, a circlet of great price, his crown about did band, the diamond's point device, there blazing bright did stand. 
Then they brought him his blazon, that was a brilliant gules, with the pentangle depicted in pure hue of gold. By the baldric he caught it, and about his neck cast it. Right well and worthily it went with the knight. And why the pentangle is proper to that prince so noble, I intend now to tell you, though it may tarry my story. It is a sign that Solomon once set on a time to betoken troth, as it is entitled to do. For it is a figure that in its five points holdeth, at each line overlaps, and is linked with another, and every way it is endless, and the English, I hear, everywhere name it the endless knot. So it suits well this knight in his unsullied arms, for ever faithful in five points, and five times under each, Gawain as good was acknowledged, and as gold refined, devoid of every vice with virtues adorned, so there the pentangle painted new, he on shield and coats did wear, as one of the word most true, and knight of bearing fair. First faultless was he found in his five senses, and next in his five fingers he failed at no time, and firmly on the five wounds all his faith was set, that Christ received on the cross, as the creed tells us, and wherever the brave man into battle was come, on this beyond all things was his earnest thought, that he ever from the five joys all his valor he gained, that to heaven's courteous queen once came from her child. For which cause the knight had in comely wise, on the inner side of his shield, her image to paint it, that when he cast his eyes thither his courage never failed. The fifth five that was used, as I find, by this knight, was free giving and friendliness, first before all, and chastity and chivalry, ever changeless and straight, and piety surpassing all points, these perfect five, were hasped upon him harder than on any man else. Now these five series, in sooth, were fastened on this knight, that each was knit with another, and had no endings, but were fixed at five points that failed not at all, coinciding in no line, nor sundered either, nor ending in any angle anywhere, as I discover, wherever the process was put in play or passed to an end. Therefore on his shining shield was shaped now this knot, royally with red gules upon red gold set. This is the pure pentangle, as the people of learning have taught. Now Gawain in brave array, his lance at last hath caught. He gave them all good day, for evermore, as he thought. He spurned his steed, and with the spurs and sprang on his way, so fiercely that the flint sparks flashed out behind him. All who beheld him so honorable in their hearts were sighing, and assenting in sooth one said to another, and assenting in sooth one said to another, grieving for that good man, Before God, tis a shame that thou, Lord, must be lost, who art in life so noble, to meet his match among men. Marry, tis not easy. To behave with more heed would have behoved one of sense, and that dear Lord duly a duke to have made, illustrious leader of liegemen in this land as befits him. And that would better have been than to be butchered to death, beheaded by an elvish man for an arrogant vaunt. Who can recall any king that such a course ever took as knights quibbling at court at their Christmas game? Many warm tears outwelling there watered their eyes, when that lord so beloved left the castle that day. No wonder he abode, but swiftly went his way, bewildering ways he rode, as the book I heard doth say. Now he rides thus arrayed through the realm of Longres, Sir Gawain in God's care, though no game now he found it. Off forlorn and alone he lodged of a night, where he found not afforded him such fare as pleased him. He had no friend but his horse in the forests and hills, no man on his march to commune with but God, till anon he drew near unto northern Wales, all the isles of Anglesey he held on his left, and over the fords he fared by the flats near the sea, and then over the hollyhead to high land again, into the wilderness of Wirral. There wandered but few who with good will regarded either God or mortal, and ever he asked as he went on of all he met, if they had heard any news of a knight that was green, in any ground thereabouts, or of the green chapel, and all denied it, saying nay, and that never in their lives a single man had they seen of that color could be. The knight took pathways strange, by many lonesome lee, and often his view did change, that chapel ere he could see. Many a cliff he climbed o'er in the countries unknown, 
Far fled from his friends, without fellowship he rode. At every wading or water on the way that he passed, he found a foe before him, save a few for a wonder. And so foul were they that fell that fight he must needs. So many a marvel in the mountains he met in those lands, that twould be tedious the tenth part to tell you thereof. At wiles with worms he wars, and with wolves also. At wiles with wood trolls that wandered in the crags, and with bulls, and with bears, and boars too at times, and with ogres that hounded him from the heights of the fells. Had he not been stalwart and staunch and steadfast in God, he doubtless would have died, and death had met often. For though war wearied him, the winter was worse, when the cold, clear water from the clouds spilling froze ere it had fallen upon the faded earth. Well nigh slain by the sleet, he slept iron-clad, more nights than an hour in the naked rocks. When clattering from the crest the cold brook tumbled, and hung high o'er his head in hard icicles, thus in peril and pain and in passes grievous, till Christmas Eve that country he crossed all alone in need, the night did at that tide, his plaint to Mary plead, her rider's road to guide, and to some lodging lead. By a mount in the morning merrily he was riding, into a forest that was deep and fearsomely wild, with high hills at each hand and hoar woods beneath, of huge aged oaks by the hundred together. The hazel and the hawthorn were huddled and tangled, with rough ragged moss around them trailing, with many birds bleakly on the bare twig sitting, that piteous pipe there for pain of the cold. The good man on Gringolet goes now before them, through many marshes and mires, a man all alone, troubled lest a truant at the time he should prove from the service of that sweet lord who on that selfsame night of a maid became man our morning to conquer and therefore sighing he said i beseech thee o lord and mary who is the mildest mother most dear for some harbour where with honour i might hear the mass and thy matins to-morrow this meekly i ask and thereto promptly i pray with potter and ave and creed in prayer he now did ride lamenting his misdeed. He blessed him oft and cried, The cross of Christ me speed! The sign of himself he had set but thrice, ere a mansion he marked within a moat in the forest, on a low mound above a lawn, laced under the branches of many a burly bowl around about the ditches, the castle most comely that ever a king possessed, placed amid a pleasance with a park all about it, within a palisade of pointed pales set closely, that took its turn around the trees for two miles or more. Gawain, from one side, gazed on the stronghold as it shimmered and shone through the shining oaks, and then humbly he doffed his helm, and with honor he thanks Jesus and St. Julian, who generous are both, who had courtesy accorded him, and to his cry hearkened. Now bon hostel, quoth the knight, I beg of you still. And he goaded Gringolet with his gilded heels, and he chose by good chance the chief passway, and brought his master bravely to the bridge's end at last. That brave bridge was uphauled, the gates were bolted fast, the castle was strongly walled, it feared no wind or blast. Then he stayed his steed that on the steep bank halted, above the deep double ditch that was drawn round the place. The wall waded in the water wondrously deep, and up again to the huge height in the air it mounted, all of hard-hewn stone to the high cornice, fortified under the battlement in the best fashion, and topped with fair turrets set by turns about, and had many graceful loopholes with a good outlook. That night a better barbican had never seen built, and inwards he beheld the hall uprising, tall towers set in turns, and as the tines clustered, their fair finials joined featly, so fine and so long, their capstones all carven with cunning and skill, many chalk-white chimneys he chanced to espy, upon the roofs of the towers all radiant white, so many a painted pinnacle was peppered about, among the crenolines of the castle clustered so thickly, that all pared out on paper it appeared to have been. The gallant knight, on his great horse good enough, thought it, if he could come by any course that enclosure to enter, to harbor in that hostel while the holy day lasted with delight. He called, and there came with speed a porter blithe and bright, and on the wall he learned his need, and hailed the errant knight. Good sir, quoth Gawain, will you go with my message to the high lord of this house for harbor to pray? Yes, by Peter, quoth the porter, and I promise indeed that you will, sir, be welcome while you wish to stay here. Then quickly the man went, and came again soon. 
servants bringing civilly to receive there the knight. They drew down the great drawbridge, and duly came forth, and on the cold earth on their knees, in courtesy knelt to welcome this wayfarer with such worship as they knew. They delivered him the broad gates, and laid them wide open, and he readily bade them rise, and rode over the bridge. Several servants then seized the saddle as he alighted, and many stout men his steed to a stable then led, while knights and esquires anon descended, to guide there in gladness this guest to the hall. When he raised up his helm, many ran there in haste, to have it from his hand, his highness to serve. His blade and his blazon both they took charge of. Then he greeted graciously those good men all, and many were proud to approach him, that prince in honor. All hasped in his harness to hall they brought him, where a fair blaze in the fireplace fiercely was burning. Then the lord of that man, leaving his chamber, came mannerly to meet the man on the floor. He said, You are welcome at your wish to dwell here. What is here, all is your own, to have in your rule and sway. Gramercy, quoth Gawain, may Christ you this repay, as men that to meet were fain, they both embraced that day. Gawain gazed at the good man who had greeted him kindly, and he thought bold and big was the baron of the castle, very large and long, and his life at the prime. Broad and bright was his beard, and all beaver hued, stern, strong in his stance upon stalwart legs, his face fell as fire and frank in his speech, and well it suited him, in sooth, as it seemed to the knight. A lordship to lead untroubled over lieges trusty, to a chamber the lord drew him, and charged men at once, to assign him an esquire, to serve and to obey him. And there to wait on his word many worthy men were, who were brought him to a bright bower where his bedding was splendid. There were curtains of costly silk with clear golden hems, and coverlets cunning wrought with quilts most lovely, of bright ermine above, embroidered at the sides, hangings running on ropes with red gold rings, carpets of costly damask that covered the walls and the floor under foot fairly to match them. There they despoiled him, speaking to him gaily, his beerny doing off and his bright armor, rich robes then readily men ran to bring him, for him to change and to clothe him, and having chosen the best, as soon as he had donned one and, and dressed was therein, as it sat on him seemly with his sailing skirts that verily in his visage of vision of spring to each man there appeared, and in marvelous hues, bright and beautiful was all his body beneath. That night, more noble than ever was made by Christ, they thought, he came, none knew from where, but it seemed to them he ought to be a prince beyond compare, in the field where fell men fought. A chair before the chimney where charcoal was burning was made ready in his room, all arrayed and covered, with cushions upon quilted cloths that were cunningly made, then a comely cloak was cast about him, a bright silk brocade embroidered him most richly, and furred fairly within the fells of the choicest, and all edged with ermine, and its hood was to match, and he sat in that seat seemly and noble, and warmed himself with a will, and then his woes were mended. Soon up on good trestles a table was raised, and clad with clean cloth, clear white to look on. There was surnap and salt cellar and silver and spoons. Then he washed as he would and went to his food, and many worthy men with worship waited upon him. Soups they served of many sorts, seasoned most choicely, in double helpings as was due, and diverse sorts of fish, some baked in bread, some broiled on the coals, some seethed, some in gravy savored with spices, and all with condiments so cunning that it caused him delight. A fair feast, he called it frankly, and often, graciously, when all those good men together there pressed him, now pray this penance deigned to take, twill improve another day, the man much mirth did make, for wine to his head made way. Then inquiry and question were carefully put, touching personal points to that prince himself, till he courteously declared that the court he belonged, that high Arthur in honor held in his sway, who was the right royal king of the round table, and twas Gawain himself as their guest now sat, and had come from that Christmas, as the case had turned out. When the lord had learned whom luck had brought him, loud laughter he thereat, so delighted he was, and they made very merry, all the men in that castle, and to appear in the presence were pressing and eager, of one who all profit and prowess and perfect manners comprised in his person and praise ever gained. Of all the men on middle earth he was most admired. Softly each said then in secret to his friend, Now fairly shall we mark the fine points of manners and the perfect expressions of polished converse, how speech as well spent will be expounded unasked, since we have found here this fine father of breeding, God has given us his goodness, his grace now indeed, who such a guest as Gawain has granted us to have. When blissful men at board for his birth sing blithe at heart, 
What manners high may mean, this knight will now impart, Who hears him will, I ween, of love speech, learn some art. When his dinner was done, and he had duly risen, It now to the night-time very near had drawn. The chaplains then took to the chapel their way, And rang the bells richly, as rightly they should, For the solemn evensong of the high season. The Lord leads the way, and his lady with him, Into a goodly oratory, gracefully she enters. Gawain follows gladly, and goes there at once, And the Lord seizes him by his sleeve, And to a seat leads him, kindly acknowledges him, And calls him by his name, Saying that most welcome he was of all the guests in the world, And grateful thanks gave him, and each greeted the other, And they sat together soberly while the service lasted. Then the lady longed to look at this knight, And from her closet she came with many comely maidens. She was fairer in face, in her flesh and her skin, her proportions, her complexion, and her point than all others, and more lovely than Guinevere, to Gawain she looked. He came through the chancel to pay court to her grace. Leading her by the left hand, another lady was there, who was older than she, indeed ancient it seemed, and held in high honor by all men about her. But unlike in their looks, those ladies appeared, for if the younger was youthful, yellow was the elder. With rose hue the one face was richly mantled, rough wrinkled cheeks rolled on the other. On the kerchiefs of one many, cur many clear pearls were, her breast and bright throat were bare displayed. With rose hue the one face was richly mantled, rough wrinkled cheeks rolled on the other. On the kerchiefs of the one many clear pearls were, her breasts and bright throat were bare displayed, fairer than the white snow that falls on the hills. The other was clad with a cloth that enclosed all her neck, and velvet was her black chin with chalk-white veils, her forehead folded in silk, and so fumbled all up, so topped up and trinketed with trifles bedecked that naught was bare of that beldam, but her brows all black, her two eyes and her nose and her naked lips, and those were hideous to behold and horribly bleared, that a worthy dame she was may well, for God be said, short body and thick waist and bulging buttocks spread, more delicious to the taste was the one she by her led. When Gawain glimpsed that gay lady that so graciously looked, with leave sought of the Lord, towards the ladies he went, the elder he saluted, low to her bowing. About the lovelier he laid then lightly his arms, and kissed her in courtly wise, with courtesy speaking. His acquaintance they requested, and quickly he begged to be their servant in sooth, if so they desired. They took him between them, and talking they led him to a fireside in a fair room and first of all called for spices, which men sped without sparing to bring them, and ever wined therewith well to their liking. The Lord, for their delight, leaped up full oft, and many times merry games being minded to make. His hood he doffed, and on high he hung it on a spear, and offered it as an honor for any to win, and who the most fun could devise at that Christmas feast. And I shall try by my troth to contend with the best, ere I forfeit this hood with the help of my friends. Thus with laughter and jollity the Lord made his jest to gladden Sir Gawain with games that night in the hall, until the time was due that the Lord for light should call. Sir Gawain with leave withdrew, and went to bed with all. On the morn when every man remembers the time that our dear Lord, for our doom to die, was born, and every home wakes happiness on earth for his sake, so did it there on that day with the dearest delights at each meal and at dinner marvelous dishes men set on the dais the daintiest meats the old ancient woman was the highest at table meetly to her side the master he took him Gawain and the gay lady together were seated in the center, where, as was seemly, the service began, and so on through the hall as honor directed, when each good man in his degree without grudge had been served. There was food, there was festival, there was fullness of joy, and to tell all the tale of it I should tedious find, though pains I might take every point of detail. Yet I ween that Gawain and that woman so fair in companionship took such pleasure together, in sweet society, soft words speaking, that courteous converse, clean and clear of all evil, that with their pleasant pastime no prince's sport compares. Drums beat, and trumps men wind. Many pipers play their airs. Each man his needs did mind, and they too minded theirs. With much feasting they fared the first and the next day, and as heartily the third came hastening after, the gaiety of St. John's Day was glorious to hear, with cheer of the choices children mass followed, and that furnished their revels as folk there intended. For there were guests who must go to the gray morning, so a wondrous wake they held, and the wine they drank, and they danced and danced on, and dearly they caroled. At least, when it was late, their leave they sought, to wend on their ways each worthy stranger. 
Good day, then, said Gawain, but the good man stayed him, and led him to his own chamber to the chimney corner, and there he delayed him, and lovingly thanked him for the pride and pleasure his presence had brought. For so honoring his house at that high season, and deigning his dwelling to adorn with his favor, believe me, sir, while I live, my luck I shall bless, that Gawain was my guest at God's own feast. Gramercy, sir, said Gawain, but the goodness is yours, and all the honor is your own. May the high king repay you, and I am under your orders, what you asked to perform, and I am bound now to be, for better or worse, by right. Him no longer to retain, the lord then pressed the knight, to him replied Gawain, that he by no means might. Then the courteous question he inquired of Gawain, what dire need had driven him on the festal date, with such keenness from the king's court to come forth alone, ere wholly the holidays from men's home had departed. In sooth, sir, he said, you say but the truth, a high errand and a hasty from that house brought me. For I am summoned myself to seek for a place, though I wonder where in the world I must find it. I would not miss coming nigh it on New Year's morning, for all the land in low grace, so our Lord help me. And so, sir, this question I inquire of you here. Can you tell me in truth, if you tale ever heard of the green chapel, on what ground it may stand, and of the great knight that guards it, all green in his color? For the terms of a tryst were between us established, to meet that man at that mark if I remained alive, and the named New Year is now nearly upon me. And I would look on that Lord, if God will allow me, more gladly, by God's Son, than gain any treasure. So indeed, if you please, depart now I must, for my business I have now but barely three days, and I would fainer fall dead than fail in my errand. Then laughing, said the Lord, Now linger you must, for when tis time for that tryst, I will teach you the road. On what ground is the green chapel? Let it grieve you no more. In your bed you shall be, sir, till broad is the day, without fret, and then fare on the first of the year, and come to the mark at mid-morn, there to make what play you know. Remain till New Year's Day, then rise and riding go. We'll set you on your way. Tis but two miles or so. Then Gawain was delighted, and in gladness he laughed. And <laughs> now I thank you a thousand times for this beyond all. Now my quest is accomplished. As you crave it, I will. Dwell a few days here, and else do what you order. The Lord then seized him, and set him in the seat beside him, and let the ladies be sent for to delight them the more, for their sweet pleasure there, and peace by themselves. For love of him that Lord was as loud in his mirth, as one near out his mind, who scarce knew what he meant. Then he called to the knight, crying out loudly, You have promised to do whatever deed I propose. Will you hold this behest here at this moment? Yes, certainly, sir, said the true knight. While I remain in your mansion, your command I'll obey. Well, turned he. You have traveled and toiled from afar, then I've kept you awake. You're not well yet, not cured, both sustenance and sleep, tis certain you need. Upstairs you shall, s upstairs you shall stay, sir, and stop there in comfort, till... Upstairs you shall stay, sir, and stop there in comfort, tomorrow till mass time, and to a meal, then go. When you wish with my wife, who with you shall sit, and comfort you in her company, till to court I return. You stay, and I shall early rouse, and a hunting wend my way. Gawain graceful bows, your wishes I will obey. One thing more, said the master, we'll make an arrangement. Whatever I win in the woods at once shall be yours, and whatever gain you may get you shall give in exchange. Shall we swap thus, sweet man? Come say what you think, whether one's luck be light or one's lot be better. By God, quoth good Gawain, I agree to it all. And whatever play you propose seems pleasant to me. Done, tis a bargain. Who'll bring us the drink? Said the lord of that land, they laughed one and all. They drank and they dallied and they did as they pleased, these lords and ladies, as long as they wished. And then with the customs of France and many courtly phrases, they stood in sweet debate and soft words bandied. And lovingly they kissed their leave-taking, with trusty attendants and torches gleaming. They were brought at last to their beds so soft one and all, yet ere to bed they came, he the bargain did oft recall. He knew how to play a game, the old governor of that hall. End of Part 2 of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight Translated by J.R.R. R. Tolkien